Um, my name is Roger Cochetti. I'm with RJC Associates and, and uh, the treasurer of the Internet Education Foundation. And on behalf of the IF, thank you for joining this, this panel uh, discussion this afternoon. Um, uh, we're going to dispense with a couple of things that are common in panel discussions, one of which is opening remarks by the panelists, another of which is any biographical information about them, so we can get right into the program. Um, I, I, uh, as you have seen from the program, um, our opening comments will be made by <laughs> Assistant Secretary Larry Strickland, um, Assistant Secretary of Commerce Larry Strickland, who's here on behalf of uh, the administration uh, uh, speaking on this topic. He has comments, unfortunately, um, he has a pressing meeting back at the Commerce Department that he uh, uh, must be back for. So. Um, he will not be able to take uh, questions at this time, but I do want to note that his comments will be put up on the web um, by this afternoon. In fact, may even be up by the time uh, we finish this this panel discussion. So without any further delay, uh, let me ask uh, Secretary Strickland to uh, uh, offer his uh, thoughts on the subject. Uh, thank you. And uh, I want to say thanks to the State of the Net Conference for giving me the opportunity to speak again here this year. Um, just gauging from the standing room only uh, nature of this room, it's apparent that this conference has grown in great importance in its years of existence as more and more people understand the importance of ensuring that the Internet remains a platform for innovation, free speech, and economic growth. Now. As we previewed when I was here last January, uh, the year turned out to be an important one for internet governance. Book ended by the Net Mundial Conference in Brazil in the spring and the International Telecommunication Union Plenipotentiary Conference in Korea in the fall. Throughout the year, the United States remained a vocal advocate of the bottom-up, consensus-based approach to internet governance known as the multi-stakeholder model. And the successful outcomes at Net Mundial and the plenipotentiary demonstrate that more and more nations are joining the United States in showing their support for this model of internet governance. They do so not because the multi-stakeholder model is an end in and of itself, but because it holds the greatest proven potential for promoting both innovation and inclusion. This year promises to be another critical year for internet governance, centering in part on efforts to complete the privatization of the internet, of the internet domain name system currently managed by ICANN. This process began in 1998 when ICANN took over important technical functions related to the domain name system, known as the IANA functions, under a contract with the United States. Last March, NTIA asked ICANN to convene a multi-stakeholder process to develop a proposal to transition the U.S. stewardship role over the IANA functions to the international community. We turned to the Internet stakeholders to drive this transition because we believe that businesses, technical experts, civil society groups are best equipped to continue to set the future direction of the Internet. We believe this transition is critical to preserving and enriching this model going forward. And we are pleased that the community responded enthusiastically to our call to develop a transition plan. Stakeholders have organized two major work streams to develop the overall plan. One is focused on the specifics of the IANA functions, and the second is addressing questions of the overall accountability of ICANN to the global community of Internet stakeholders. Both groups are well underway. You will hear firsthand from some of the participants in the panel following my remarks. And they are working according to a schedule that would deliver a transition plan to us in the summer. Today, I would like to answer some of the questions that have arisen in recent weeks about NTIA's role in the transition, and then to pose some questions of our own for stakeholders to consider as they continue their work to develop the plan. We do so in good faith and in appreciation of the hard work of the volunteer community engaged in these discussions. At the outset, let me address the impact of last December's Appropriations Act on the tr transition planning process. From the day of our announcement last March, some, including members of Congress, have raised questions and concerns about the transition. We welcome their interest, and we acknowledge the validity of many of these concerns. And we think it is important that questions about the transition be addressed and answered. 
We also believe that a robust, open, and transparent multi-stakeholder process is the best vehicle for ensuring that result. Nothing in the Appropriations Act affects the activities of industry, civil society, and the technical community to develop the transition plan we called for last March. We expect their work to continue and look forward to its conclusion. But the Act does restrict NTIA from using appropriated dollars to relinquish our stewardship during fiscal year 2015 with respect to Internet domain name system functions. We take that obligation seriously, and accordingly, we will not use our appropriated funds to terminate the IANA functions contract with ICANN prior to the contract's current expiration date of September 30th, nor will we use appropriated dollars to amend the cooperative agreement with VeriSign to eliminate NTIA's role in approving changes to the authoritative root zone file prior to September 30th. On these points, there is no ambiguity. The legislative language, however, makes it equally clear that Congress did not expect us to sit on the sidelines this year. The Act imposes regular reporting requirements on NTIA to keep Congress apprised of the transition process. To meet those requirements, NTIA will actively monitor the discussions and activities within the multi-stakeholder community as it develops the transition plan. We will participate in meetings and discussions with ICANN, VeriSign, other governments, and the stakeholder community with respect to the transition. And we will continue to represent the United States at the meetings of ICANN's Governmental Advisory Committee. We will provide informal feedback where appropriate. We are as aware as anyone that we should not do anything that interferes with an open and participatory multi-stakeholder process. We support a process where all ideas are welcome and where participants are able to test fully all transition options. Nonetheless, the community should proceed as if it has only one chance to get this right. Everyone has a responsibility to participate as they deem appropriate. And so if, by asking questions, we can ensure that the community develops a well thought out plan that answers all reasonable concerns, we will do so. Now, I've been asked on numerous occasions, what is the United States looking for in a plan? And I've consistently answered that we are looking for a plan that preserves ICANN as a multi-stakeholder organization outside of government control, which the community develops through an open and transparent multi-stakeholder process, and that has the broad support of stakeholders. No stakeholder or set of stakeholders has a veto over this process, whether it be governments, industry, or civil society. However, they all need to have a voice, including ICANN leaders who are stakeholders and community representatives themselves, in helping to inform a proposal to ensure it has broad support. Let me repeat, the proposal must support and enhance the multi-stakeholder model of internet governance in that it should be developed by the community and have broad support. More specifically, we will not accept a transition proposal that replaces the NTIA role with a government-led or intergovernmental organization solution. In addition, the proposal must maintain the security, stability, and resiliency of the domain name system. The proposal must meet the needs and expectations of the global customers and partners of the IANA services. And finally, it must maintain the openness of the internet. Now that we are more than 10 months past our announcement, it is important to take stock of where the transition process stands. As I mentioned earlier, there are two parallel work streams proceeding at the moment. The work streams are directly linked, and we have repeatedly said that both tracks must be addressed before any transition takes place. In the first track, the IANA Stewardship Transition Coordination Group, the ICG, representing more than a dozen internet stakeholder communities, issued a call for proposals last fall for each of the three primary IANA functions, protocol parameters, numbering, and domain names. Two of the three groups have already finished their draft proposals. The Internet Engineering Task Force, which is shepherding the protocol parameter proposal, uh, finalized and submitted its plan to the ICG on January the 6th. The five regional internet registries, which work collaboratively in developing the numbering proposal, announced their final plan on January the 15th. And third, an ICANN cross-community working group on the naming-related functions released a draft proposal on December 1st and is continuing to work through the comments received in response. 
We have taken a look at the December 1st proposal and the ensuing comments and discussions it has engendered. As the working group on the naming related functions continues to work to finalize its draft proposal, NTIA would like to offer the following questions for stakeholders to consider. The draft proposes the creation of three or four new entities to be involved in the naming related processes. Could the creation of any new entity interfere with the security and stability of the DNS during or after the transition? And given that the community will need to develop, implement, and test new structures and processes prior to a final transition, can it get all this done in a time frame consistent with the expectations of all stakeholders? Does the proposal ensure a predictable and reliable process for customers of root zone management services? Under the current system, registry operators can be confident of the timing of review and implementation of routine updates. If a new committee takes up what is currently a routine procedural check, how will the community protect against processing delays and the potential for politiz politicization of the system? In response to the December 1 draft, other suggestions have emerged. Are all these options and proposals being adequately considered in a manner that is fair and transparent? How does the proposal avoid recreating existing concerns in a new form or creating new concerns? If the concern is the accountability of the existing system, does creating new structures and committees simply create a new set of accountability questions? We would suggest that all of these questions need to be addressed and resolved prior to approval of any transition plan. The second process is addressing how to enhance ICANN's accountability to the global internet community in the absence of the contractual relationship with NTIA. Stakeholders are working through the Enhancing ICANN Accountability Cross-Community Working Group, and early reports indicate that this working group is making significant progress on an agreement on the definition of the problem, a list of stress tests to be conducted, and the specific short-term issues that need to be addressed prior to any transition. As we have consistently stated, it is critical that this group conduct stress testing of proposed solutions to safeguard against future contingencies, such as attempts to influence or take over ICANN, be it the board, the staff, or any stakeholder group that are not currently possible given its contract with NTIA. We also encourage this group to address questions such as how to remove or replace board members should stakeholders lose confidence in them, and how to incorporate and approve current accountability tools like the reviews called for in the affirmation of commitments. As both groups continue their work, it is important that the draft proposals are tested and validated. This will give confidence that any process, procedure, or structure proposed actually works, and it will also help facilitate NTIA's review of the final transition proposal. And finally, the plan must be comprehensive and complete. The proposal needs to address all the functions included in the IANA contract, including management of the .int top-level domain. I want to reiterate again that there is no hard and fast deadline for the transition. September 2015 has been a target date because that is when the base period of the contract we have with ICANN expires. But this should not be seen as a deadline. If the community needs more time, we have the ability to extend the contract for up to four years. And so it's up to the community to determine a timeline that works best for stakeholders as they develop a proposal that meets NTIA's conditions, but also works for the community. So this is a lot for stakeholders to consider, but I am confident that the community will get this right and will come out stronger at the end of the process. We all have a stake in this transition in ensuring that the internet remains an open, dynamic platform for economic and social progress. On a final note, as you can see, NTIA has a busy internet policy agenda, both on the international front and domestically. Um, and to help us deal with the workload, we're looking for a few good men and women. Um, we've just posted openings for several positions in our Office of International Affairs and our Office of Policy Analysis and Development. So if any of you um, are interested, or if you can, please spread the word. Uh, we're looking for some bright, energetic folks who are equal to jump on board and tackle these cutting edge internet policy issues. So with that uh, uh, public service announcement, we can get on to the panel, and I want to thank you for listening. Thanks. Join me in thanking uh, Secretary Strickland for your comments.
I, I, as I said earlier, I'm sorry to, to uh, report that Secretary Strickland can't remain for questions, but we will have a panel discussion and questions from the from the um, participants in, in a few minutes. Uh, we have had another change in the uh, program from what was published. O originally, um, <coughs> Jeff Farah from the Senate uh, Commerce Committee had been scheduled to participate. Um, he had, um, unfortunately, a family matter that took him away from uh, the panel discussion today. Uh, David Reddle, um, the uh, Chief Counsel of the House Commerce Committee, um, has been good enough to uh, join us literally at the last minute. And, and, and he also, unfortunately, doesn't have time to stay for the full panel discussion, but he's, he's agreed to stay for a few minutes and offer his observations on this topic. And uh, David, would you prefer to speak from the podium or from your chair, whichever you... I'm more of a stander. Then so. please, uh, let me get the... Uh, uh, <coughs> not sure I'm not worried about the podium, but... Well, thanks for having me, even if it is batting second for the Senate and uh, at last minute. But it's, uh, it's nice to be here with you guys, and, and thanks to State of the Net for asking me to come join. Uh, as many of you know, the House Energy and Commerce Committee has been very active on these issues since uh, the uh, administration announced that they would be looking into transitioning the IANA functions out of the commerce contract and into the multi-stakeholder system. And I think it goes without saying, based on the hearings we've had and the engagement we've had, that you know uh, my members have some concerns. We held a hearing last Congress, and uh, Assistant Secretary Strickling was good enough to join us and, uh, and share his views on this issue. And having sat here and caught at least the last part of his remarks, uh, I'm happy to hear that a number of the things that were raised at uh, my boss's hearing seem to have been incorporated into the multi-stakeholder discussions. Stress tests, what it would mean to move this system outside of the U.S. government, and certainly the impact that it would have if this were not part of the U.S. legal system are just a few of the questions that were raised at our hearing, and we're glad to hear that they're being addressed. Additionally, last Congress, uh, Mr. Shimkus and others offered the DOT-COM Act, which uh, our members thought was a responsible path forward to taking a look uh, within the U.S. government at how this transition would occur. Essentially what that bill said was that once a proposal had been received by Commerce, we would take a one-year period and pause and ask the GAO to take a look at what the real-world impacts of adopting that proposal would be. While dot-com didn't make it into law last Congress, um, we are happy to see that at least between now and the end of fiscal 15, because of the uh, funds limitation that was in the the uh, appropriations package at the end of last year that we'll be looking at least at between now and the end of September, a period where we can take a look at what's coming out of that multi-stakeholder system and assess its impact. I would expect, based on Mr. Shimkus's comments, that the dot-com act will be reintroduced again, although it's path forward at this point um, we haven't had a discussion of. Additionally, the GAO report that we were looking at has already at least begun to look at issues that it can uh, address without having a proposal in front of it. Uh, my boss has asked GAO to take a look at what the real world impact of that is in the absence of a proposal to make a transition, and their work is well underway. We're looking forward to GAO issuing that report and it becoming part of the discussion as everyone looks at what will happen as we move the IANA functions out of commerce and into a multi-stakeholder system. Uh, as far as next steps, you know, the dot-com act, as I said, is likely to be introduced and, um, and we'll be taking a look at that. We're very much looking forward to working with NTIA and ICANN on a forward-looking basis. We've, uh, we've been meeting with them a number of times over the course of the last year to express our concerns and to make sure that uh, they're being addressed. And, and I, like I said, we're pleasantly surprised to see that those issues are all being incorporated into the process. Um, we're looking forward to seeing the output of that as well. Uh, the committee has spent a lot of time over the last four years getting involved in uh, some of the international internet governance issues. We think it's one of the more important issues that falls within the ambit of the Commerce Committee, and we, are, uh, we intend to continue moving forward uh, on that. The last piece I would like to chime in on and, and, and reiterate from what Assistant Secretary Strickling had uh, in his remarks is uh, the issue of ICANN accountability mechanisms. Um, it's our understanding that those mechanisms are working on a path that is parallel with uh, the changes that are being considered in the multi-stakeholder system for IANA. We're happy that from what we're hearing, it sounds like those changes will be on a path to be implemented before or at the same time as an IANA transition would be targeted to occur. We think it's very important that that be a piece of the transition and that we ensure that the things that we have been um, very strict about making sure are part of this are backed up by a strong governance model at ICANN in addition to a strong model for the IANA transition. 
Uh, other than that, uh, again, I apologize that I'm running in and running out with remarks, but uh, we, uh, <laughs> having been asked to jump in at the last minute, unfortunately, I wasn't able to, to clear more time. But thank you to State of the Net for asking me to join, and um, good luck with the rest of the panel. Thank you, David. Join me in thanking him for uh, coming down on short notice to uh, participate. Um, I'd like to spend just a minute and talk about the, the, the way we'll proceed since we have limited time and, and um, um, a very qualified panel um, to discuss the topic. And, and uh, what we're uh, going to do is, uh, following my remarks, um, uh, I'm going to ask the panel members to comment on the two presentations that we've just heard. Um, following their comments, we'll open the uh, discussion to the floor. Um, given the uh, limited amount of time we have, I'm going to ask that if you do have a question um, from the floor, uh, you identify yourself and any affiliation that you have um, and uh, keep your question to a simple and direct question um, as opposed to um, what I'm sure many of us could uh, offer, and that is um, lengthy observations and, and comments. Um, I did want to mention uh, one thing this has come up. It's probably useful to put this in some perspective. The debate that is taking place today on this topic um, actually goes back um, about 20 years ago. Um, at the time uh, that the National Science Foundation announced that it was going to relinquish responsibility for the administrative functions of what many people at that time still called the NSFNet, um, the issue of how these functions would be managed were, was thrown out in, for public debate. Um, at that time, I happened to be handling what was uh, then called Internet policy for um, the largest uh, information technology company in the world, and, and our responsibility uh, in, in that context was to meet with foreign governments and discuss with them how the administrative functions of the internet um, should be managed. It is important to recognize that 20 years ago, the world was a very different place. Um, the, 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 the big internet companies of, of the day were Netcom, Netscape, uh, UUNet, and, and many other companies that uh, are, are only a memory today. And, and, and it's also important to recognize that at that time, um, the future of the Internet itself was widely debated, and probably a majority of people in the industry felt that network computing would proceed along the lines of a series of private networks like CompuServe and Prodigy and others and not an interconnected internetwork. A as a result, the discussions about the future of the administrative functions of, of the Internet with foreign governments um, were vastly different than anything that's taken place today. And um, having met with um, well over a dozen foreign governments at that time and presented the case to them for what was later and not, not at that time called multi-stakeholder approach to um, Internet governance, um, I, I can tell you that the, 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 the number one reason that uh, governments around the world were comfortable with this approach um, was that they didn't really care about the topic. And uh, perhaps the, the most memorable quote that I can think of from that era was when the senior official, uh, a senior official from the U.S. government um, uh, stated that um, someday there will be 500 million people using the Internet, and when that day comes, it won't make much difference whether 60 million people from France are participating in the Internet or not. Of course, we know that today 500 million people are using the Internet in China alone, so that um, it, it, it illustrates how what a different time uh, we're dealing with. But it is also remarkable to me as a, as a student of this subject that the, the issues are approximately the same. The, 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 the industry has changed. Most of the titans of the Internet industry today were playing high school basketball at the time that that debate took place, but the issues today are very similar to those, and, and, and the principles are very similar to those that were debated at that time. With that general introduction and, and recognition that we're talking about a subject which today is very important, um, I'd like to invite the panel to comment on the two um, uh, remarks, the two presentations that we've just heard, and then we'll open it up to the floor. So, um, Steve, you want to, why don't we just go straight down? Steve, why don't you start? 
Thank you, Roger. And I, I fully appreciate Secretary Strickling's broad perspective and his acknowledgement that giving up the IANA contract is far more than just the three functions, the naming protocols, and the numbers. In fact, he has acknowledged many times and today the symbolic value, the discipline that's exerted upon ICANN by the fact that the U.S. government could pull back ICANN's real power to exist, could pull away its authority to manage the route where all the top-level domains live. That symbolic or disciplinary effect gives rise to that whole second track of ICANN's accountability to the community. And I think it's been great to acknowledge that, to allow it to have its own thread. But having said that, it's going to be very difficult for us to pull that off. And I do think that uh, Secretary Strickling mentions that it should be elements of accountability that the Commerce Department exerts today. But frankly, if any of you were to dive into that 65-page IANA contract, boy, you'd be hard-pressed to find specific line items that need to map to what the community is working on right now. Instead, I think it's better to imagine the entire IANA contract is just a single piece of paper that if you roll it up, it becomes a stick, a club. And that is where its most effective and important effect is on ICANN. We're going to give that up eventually. That's been in the cards for a while. But before we do, we need to replace it. And that's like replacing the avionics on an airplane while it's flying. It's going to be a challenge. And it's a challenge that the community is, is working tirelessly on, but may not be able to deliver on the time frame of, uh, of the summertime. Thank you. Um, why don't we just uh, move straight down, please. Thank you. Um, very briefly, there are a couple of points, I would say, straight away on which we will certainly, the European Union will certainly need to have more clarity from NTIA, and specifically on the point uh, on which Secretary Strickling, uh, under Secretary Strickling, uh, um, said that NTIA will not use appropriated dollars to end the IANA contract or the cooperative agreement with Versign. And we will probably need to understand what that means precisely in case an acceptable proposal gets on the desk of NTIA before September 2015, which was the plan, uh, the announced, the original announced date for the change. Again, I'm not taking a position on that at the moment. That's perfectly within the prerogative of Congress and TIA to uh, respectfully legislate and act on that. But we will certainly need a bit more clarity. Um, I was very positively struck by the uh, mention both by uh, Larry Strickling and by the colleague from Congress uh, on the way in which accountability has to be strictly linked with the whole IANA, the accountability of ICANN as an organization has to be strictly linked with the IANA transition process. And on that, I would like to say, to be absolutely crystal clear, we are in full agreement. The European Union is in full agreement that before any IANA transition can take place, there have to be very clear accountability measures in place. Now, of course, the discussion is which measures of accountability, whether we can have a prioritization. Uh, the perfect is the enemy of the good, we say in Italy, so you can't have everything uh, in one single place immediately. There has, however, to be a very precise plan, at the very least, uh, on how the different measures for accountability that the community at large will come to agreement, uh, will come to agreement too, uh, how will those will be implemented? And uh, uh, one last point, uh, uh, if I may, I'm sorry, I'm Italian, so I always tend to speak beyond uh, uh, the deadline. Um, the European Commission, uh, the organization which I work for, was, I believe, the first uh, entity, the first organization to react to the, announce to the announcement of NTIA of the 14th of March of 2014, that the transition would take place, and we reacted uh, congratulating the U.S. government. Mm -hmm. And I remember that very clearly because I was drafting the press release with those congratulations at 2 a.m. at night, so I have that day very clear in my mind. And I say this because uh, I want it to be absolutely clear that we consider ourselves as partners with the U.S. government and with Congress in this process. We both believe, both Europe and the U.S. believe that that is a very important step. The political courage, quite frankly, of the U.S. administration to do, to make this step, should be recognized. We might have some disagreements here and there, and as the panel progresses, maybe we can unpack some of those disagreements. Uh, but at the end of the day, my belief, our belief, is that we are broadly in agreement uh, on what the next step should be, and especially on the fact, and allow me to reiterate this, there should be no transition uh, uh, unless precise and trustable accountable measures are in place. Um, thank you.
uh, Milton. Uh, by the way, again, I have not introduced the panel because for sake of time, we're just going to go right through it. Yes, this is uh, Milton Mueller at Syracuse University and the Internet Governance Project. Uh, let me first make a few comments about the overall significance of this transition. It may seem very technical and obscure. And it's not really quite what, I th what Larry said it was about. It's not just about bottom-up multi-stakeholder governance versus governmental governance. It's about transnational globalized governance by non-sovereign entities, non-state sovereigns, in a, in a fully globalized governance regime, which is completely new, which is based on the sovereignty of internet users and suppliers rather than the sovereignty of traditional national governance. So it's a very significant transition. Now let me just comment about uh, one of the fundamental things you have to understand about this transition, and that is you need to carefully distinguish between ICANN as a policymaker for the DNS and ICANN and the IANA functions as the implementer of those policies. Um, the accountability for ICANN as a policymaker is very different from accountability of the performance of the IANA functions, and we need to make sure those two things are carefully separated in these new mechanisms. In that regard, let me respond to what Steve said. We are not giving up the stick, or at least we don't need to. Uh, we should retain contracting for the IANA functions, as they already do for the IETF, for the protocols functions, and the uh, numbers people do for the IP addresses. Both of those entities can say to ICANN, we no longer want you to perform these functions, we're going to find somebody else. That has to happen with names also, and that serves a very important accountability function, and I can't imagine giving that up and just saying, oh, you've got it forever. The, the, in fact, the only person I know who is actually not in favor of that is ICANN. <laughs> um, and that sort of brings me to Strickling's comments about ICANN as a stakeholder. Yes, ICANN is a stakeholder in this process, and they have very important levels of expertise and a very good record, actually, in providing the IANA functions. Uh, but we also have to realize that they have a bit of an interest in uh, retaining the IANA functions, and, and so I certainly wouldn't want to give them a, a veto over where it goes. <clears throat> now, moving on to the House Speaker, um, I think I see a very constructive move in the House of Representatives and possibly also the Senate to, uh, they're moving away from an attempt to preempt the multi-stakeholder process to a more of an idea of setting appropriate parameters on it in terms of the legislation that I expect to see coming out. I think that's the right thing to do. I think the early reactions were indeed reactionary and they were trying to say, let's assert our authority and take this process over. I think they've come to realize that this is a global multi-stakeholder process, and what they can do is put some boundaries on it, like the NTIA has done. And I think the, the role of the House, which is most constructive, is that they have said, we're concerned about Internet freedom. We want to make sure that this transition does not threaten Internet freedom. And the best way to do that, frankly, is for ICANN, again, with the, talking about the policy process accountability, to have a judiciary system that can constrain the scope of what ICANN can make policy about. And that constraint should include a First Amendment, if you will, that says you shall make no rule that violates freedom of expression on the Internet. And this kind of check should not occur through some kind of a secondary board that second guesses what the actual board does. It should occur through very clear, explicit rules based about ICANN's mission and there should be an appeals process when their policies exceed or go outside the bounds of that mission, uh, then you have <clears throat> a, an enforcement mechanism for simply reversing that policy. But I don't like these proposals in which we're setting up another group of people that can overrule the board. You know, what makes those people accountable? Uh, what makes it clear that their overruling will be a good policy or a bad policy? I think we have to have very explicit, clear rules that bound ICANN's mission and then have a, an appeals process in which anybody affected can make an appeal that would challenge uh, a policy that strays beyond the boundaries of uh, Internet freedom. Thank you. <laughs> Teresa. Well, first, um, thank you for having us here. You need to pull that closer. Okay. Okay. How's that? Is that better? 
that better? You have a very soft voice. I have a very soft voice. Yeah. Okay, there we go. I shall shout into the phone or whatever this or is, the microphone. Um, so first, thanks for having us here. And I think from this conversation and from the dialogue and also from um, the first two speakers, it's very clear that there's a lot of issues and dynamics around um, the announcement of this transition. I just want to go back to a point that Roger had noted at the beginning. We're sort of in a, a very historic time. We're in a very historic time um, of internet policy overall. I think we all remember the times of ICANN's formation, of the times of setting up that unique organization, uh, the community selection mechanisms, all of that. And we're now reaching the phase where we have the opportunity to transition uh, NTI stewardship role uh, into the multi-stakeholder community. And I just wanted to observe and recognize really the community work around all of this. The community has made a tremendous effort over time and since the announcement. Um, working over the holiday period, no breaks, nothing whatsoever. Many of our panelists here, and I think that's an important sign of trying to achieve consensus and trying to reach the right kinds of uh, direction that we want to take this. And so I think these conversations here are an important part of that, and um, we should look at where we want to go ahead. So I'll leave it with that. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I'm now going to open the uh, floor for uh, questions to the panel. And um, I do have a few questions myself, so if there are none ready on the floor, I will ask the panel to comment on a few other things. But if anyone has a question, please uh, raise your hand. And, and uh, as I said, uh, um, give us your name and affiliation. So please, right back here. Hi, Carrie Jeff, with the Central Department of Integrity. I was looking at your own testimony given to Congress on this issue of the ICANN transition and the technical framework preservation is important. The trademarks have been decimated by the culture, the domain industry that ICANN is, is proliferating more so now as you're breaking down geographically and other. I don't know where to continue the question other than to make a statement and have you respond with. That testimony was not held to trademarks and investments into trademarks uh, it wasn't a question, but, it, but but there was a question. Do you do, does anyone on the panel have a comment on the on the uh, impact of of the current system on trademarks? Uh, yeah, Carrie. The one of the policy areas that that ICANN does exert is to help to protect consumers from fraud, from cyber squatting, and that ends up often using trademark as a recognized international law mechanism to go after somebody who's hosting a. Red Cross, uh, Red Cross Rescue .org, when in fact they're not the Red Cross at all, stopping people from being defrauded, and I and I can has been a responsible actor in that area. That shows up whenever we launch new top level domains. It shows up in new policies for who is accuracy and cyber squatting. So I, I believe that I can has internalized that as an important aspect, and uh, and everyone at this table works hard to make that happen. No, no. I'm, so, I'm sorry. Uh, we have another comment up here, so let's let's let, at least let Actually, Milton. he said what I was going to say. Said, so. Okay. Um, over here, yes, please, again, if you would identify yourself and any affiliation. Sir, Andrew Mack, Andrew Lovell Consulting here in Washington. I guess my question is this. We recognize that getting to some sort of agreement by September is going to be difficult. Is there any reason why you think that getting to some sort of agreement by September is a pretty heroic task? Uh, there's an awful lot that needs to happen between now and then. If we don't get where we need to be by September, what is your impression about uh, what's 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 the meaning of that, and do you think there will be any ramifications for ICANN or for the relationship with the uh, Department of Commerce? Teresa. So I, I think we heard in Larry's remarks um, his comments about the timeline. I, I don't think it has a negative impact. I think that the demonstrated effort by the community to really address some of the very hard issues. Um, is an example of, of the progress being made. And I think what's most important is that um, there's consensus in that um, the proposals are gotten right, um, that the IANA transition proposal is right, that the operational communities are comfortable with that, um, that the accountability mechanisms and the linkage between that are gotten right, and that we need to move that forward really well. Um, so I think it's most important to keep the pro progress going. Yeah, I would like to address that, that question, that point as well. Uh, from our perspective, uh, while we do recognize that uh, the, the 
it is challenging. The discussions are challenging. There are issues, uh, and this we absolutely recognize. Uh, and we also, and I want to be very clear on this, we absolutely recognize the prerogative, the right of the U.S. Congress to legislate on this matter, or the U.S. administration to act uh, in the interests of U.S. citizens as they see it. Uh, Besides the discussion within the community, as we heard from the representative from Congress, there have also been legislative moves or legislative proposals. On that, l allow me just to say that I, I hope, we hope that both U.S. administration, the U.S. administration and the U.S. Congress understands that these discussions are not purely U.S. national discussions. These discussions have an impact uh, on the global stage. And the way in which the U.S. administration and U.S. Congress will address these issues uh, will be seen uh, not only by Europe, by the way, by the rest of the world, as a proof uh, or as a demonstration uh, of the uh, intentions of the U.S. government to really proceed on what they had committed to. This is the first answer to your question. The second answer is, as I mentioned before, uh, uh, again, the best is the enemy of the good. Uh, and we should not, we should not, while we all want to preserve the security and stability of the internet, we all want a solution that will avoid capture by uh, any government, that is also the position of, uh, of Europe. Uh, we, we want all the conditions the NTA has put, we want a good plan. Uh, we also, as somebody uh, that has participated in many international discussions, like other fellow colleagues on the panel, we also do not want to give the possibility to any entity, whether public or private, out there beyond Europe and beyond the US. We do not want the possibility to use any undue delay as an excuse uh, for pushing for other intergovernmental solutions in other fora. I will make myself even clearer. There are discussions uh, at the United Nations uh, in other fora which are calling for a complete uh, review of the way in which the current system is working. Now, the US has a view on that. Europe has another view on that. Those views are not always in agreement, to be absolutely clear. But I think that the broad lines, uh, we, we agree on the broad lines. And uh, we should be very careful uh, not to get to September 15 uh, without nothing in our hands. At the very least, uh, we should get to September 15 uh, or 30th. I don't remember anymore what is the deadline. 30th, so yeah. The 30th. Um, well, I'm Italian, so two weeks of difference doesn't <laughs> change anything anyway. But um, that's more or less the delay we get in meetings in any case. But uh, we should get to the, to the deadline with as much change as possible and with a very, very clear timeline on how to implement the subsequent changes that will be necessary. We cannot get to September 30th saying, uh, well, guys, we have joked and we have nothing to show to the rest of the world. That would be extremely problematic to handle. In, in the principles surrounding, thanks for the question, Andrew, the principles surrounding the design of this transition are embedded in three simple words, bottom-up, multi-stakeholder consensus process. And for any of you who have practiced that for any amount of time in the ICANN space, you'll know that that makes, uh, that makes the making of sausage or the making of laws look trivial and easy. The multi-stakeholder process is incredibly messy, particularly with hundreds of people participating with different cultures, different backgrounds, different perspectives, in a way that we have to try to bring everyone to consensus. Uh, the reality is that process as hard as we are working, that process may not achieve concrete outcomes that address the stress tests in time. And if that were the case, I'd want Andrea and his colleagues outside of the process to really recognize the fact that it isn't any foot dragging, it isn't any trying to put the toothpaste back in the tube and shut down the transition, but an acknowledgement of the reality that this is heavy lifting. And in, uh, the committee that uh, Andrea spoke of, the, the congressional moves. I think initially you saw some moves to have legislation to stop the process or pause the process. But that pivoted in a very constructive way. It pivoted, thanks to Chairman Walden's perspective, to say that, OK, let's look at things like stress tests. Stress tests are not roadblocks. They're more like guardrails that we can use to assess what mechanisms we've come up with and understand whether they'll prevent problems that are not just relevant to the U.S., Andrea, the problems that the stress tests check against, and I hope that we have time to discuss them, Roger, those are problems that would be felt by and are concerns of every stakeholder across the world. Uh, Milton has a comment, and then Andrea wanted to respond. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, support what Andrea said about, uh, you know, putting pressure on us to do this 
quickly as possible is very important. It's not about rushing through things that are complicated, but it's about not allowing people to start playing games. And the longer this drags out, uh, the more opportunity there is for political games to be played uh, by numerous parties, not just governments, not just the ITU, uh, but the stakeholders themselves can start renegotiating deals and doing things. So it's very good that there's pressure on us to get this done as quickly as possible. Thank you for giving me the time to react to that. And, and I just want to be clear on this point because Steve, I, uh, I'm sure you don't believe that I believe that, but I just want to be clear on the fact that uh, I do not believe that there is, at this point in time, there is an intention uh, among the various volunteers who are donating their time, uh, and it's a lot of time, a Christmas break and all of that, to uh, play any games. That is not my perception. However, in politics, uh, and that is in national politics and international politics, uh, perception uh, is 99% uh, of what's happening. And there is a risk uh, that, uh, sorry to reiterate, there is a risk if we arrive to the 30th of September, whatever is the deadline, without uh, concrete ideas at the very least, uh, the perception will be that there has been food dragging. Whether that is the reality or not, but that will be the perception. That will be the argument that will be used uh, in other fora. That is why I appreciate that, uh, and just like I appreciate Steve's work, I appreciate Milton's work, and uh, all the volunteers' work. I used to work in this environment mm -hmm. until not so long ago. Uh, then I decided I wanted to have a life, and I moved to <laughs> something else. But uh, um, uh, while we really appreciate them. By the way, there are colleagues from the European Commission who are also attending these meetings and are also sacrificing their Christmas breaks uh, to make sure that this works. This is a collective effort. Uh, I'm happy that Milton uh, recognizes the fact that if and when there is pressure from entities such as the European Commission, the European Union and others, uh, it's not because we accuse anyone of bad faith, uh, but it is because we know by experience uh, in our own area of work uh, that sometimes external pressure can help uh, to unlock deadlocks that can happen in this discussion. Let me say it another way. If there was no external pressure, if we were saying, yeah, yeah, look, you know, 30th of September, fine, December, fine, February 2016, fine, would people work that hard uh, to get to a solution? Uh, I don't believe so, because probably they would prefer to spend their time with their families during the Christmas break. Now, that means that I and my colleagues are guilty for your missed Christmas breaks, and I'm sorry for that, but it's something that we need to do. I think it was Milton who said this is, or Milton or Theresa, I don't remember, this is a historic moment, uh, and we are not going to have uh, this particular conjunction <laughs> of, 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 of things that are happening that are allowing us to move in a direction uh, which in the end I think Europe and the US agree on, uh, which is to avoid the bilateral, to change a bilateral relationship between uh, ICANN or the IANA contract performer and the US government, uh, which even though in practice has never created any problem, uh, it has endlessly been used uh, as an argument by other countries uh, in ways uh, using the argument that the U.S. controls the Internet. You know we know that that is not true, but that argument has been used. Uh, and if we fix that, then we can move on uh, to discuss about, frankly, more pressing issues that we need to discuss, uh, avoiding the sort of silly arguments uh, that take up so much time in any international discussion on Internet governance issues. Thank you. Um, let me pose a panel, uh, a question to the panelists that uh, was a very important uh, issue um, 15 or 20 years ago when this uh, field was was first opened up and has not been much addressed this time around and then and, and, and that is the location of the multi-stakeholder organization that administers the administrative functions of, of the internet um, obviously a nonprofit organization um, constituted under the laws of the state of California is subject to the laws of the state of California and subject to the laws of the United States. As one uh, government official from another country told me, the lowest level justice of the peace in California can overrule the Supreme Court of my country. How can I support that? The issue of location of the multi-stakeholder organization does have an enormous impact because it is, sub it is the organization I can is subject to the laws of the of the uh, jurisdictions in which it's located. Uh, I, let me pose the question to the panel. Um, has this topic uh, been actively discussed? Do you have views on uh, this topic? And, and how do you think the, um, uh, the, the United States government should uh, approach this as it, as it proceeds? Uh, Milton? Yes, speaking uh, as somebody 
very uh, active in the cross-community working group on the names uh, proposal. Uh, we have discussed jurisdiction several times, and there was an analysis of the public comments on the Frankfurt proposal, which also showed some concern about jurisdiction coming from uh, certain governments around the world, as well as some uh, CCTLDs. Um, the, the interesting thing is that with respect, again, distinguishing between ICANN, the policymaker, and IANA, ICANN, the policymaker, I don't detect any serious support and a great deal of opposition to changing the jurisdiction. I just don't see that, that uh, any proposal to move ICANN's jurisdiction is ever going to come out of the accountability working group. Indeed, the people most concerned about accountability don't want them to be uh, jurisdiction shopping, if you will, uh, and also the registries and registrars have contracts that are grounded uh, already in U.S. law. Those are the basis of their entire business. So they are going to be very conservative about jurisdiction. With the contracting entity that would uh, let out the uh, IANA functions, we have some more degrees of freedom with respect to jurisdiction. But again, we've done some polling of members of this working group, and we don't find a groundswell of opposition to that being in the U.S., uh, we don't find any particular coalescence around that being in Switzerland or anywhere else. We have a legal study going in which we're going to, once we've identified better the characteristics of this entity, uh, is there an ideal jurisdiction for it? But uh, so far the work ha on jurisdiction has been very rational and uh, not, not that disruptive. Yeah. So, some of the concerns of governments expressing legal jurisdiction is a red herring. Keep in mind that any government anywhere on the planet has full control of the conduct and content that takes place within its borders. And none of that has anything to do with where ICANN happens to be located. Countries can cut off content that comes over the internet if they think it's offensive to their own sensibilities and laws. They can prosecute companies no matter where they are if they are selling products or services to their citizens. So the ICANN concept of legal is precisely what Milton Mueller described. It's just a contracting entity. ICANN will make contracts with companies that ordinarily act as registries and registrars. And now there are a lot more than there used to be with the expansion of the top-level domain space. And like Milton, I would observe that there isn't a lot of call for move it from the U.S. There's certainly a call to expand the places where ICANN is positioned. But let's keep in mind that contract parties, more than anything else, want some certainty, some certainty about how the contract would be interpreted, how it could be challenged, how arbitration would occur. And that certainty is best served by consistency in this case. So failing a better argument to pull up ICANN's roots and leave U.S. jurisdiction, failing that kind of an argument, I can't see that it will rise to the level of consensus as something we want to do in this current transition. Um, I would say straight away that within Europe, well, of course, there have been discussion on the issue of the jurisdiction of ICANN, and these are not happening now. They have been uh, taking place for a very long time. Uh, there are some member states, uh, I wouldn't say the majority of member states, but there are some member states who have uh, hotly debated, and in some cases taken the official position that the jurisdiction of ICANN, the location of ICANN, should be changed from the U.S. <laughs> that, for the time being, is not a European position. It's not the position of the European Union. But again, I want to stress the issue is being debated. And the reason why it is being debated, I think that when people use the term jurisdiction, uh, uh, they uh, exclude the people on the panel, which of course are perfectly aware of what I'm talking about. But when I, I go outside of this environment and I start to talk about jurisdiction, uh, people get easily they, they, it, can, it can happen very easily that they don't understand the complexities that lie behind such a simple word. Because you have a jurisdiction uh, depending on the particular location where ICANN is. There is a jurisdiction which depends on the different contracts, as Milton has mentioned, as Steve has mentioned, that, that ICANN enters into. And these are contracts with registries, contracts with registrars. Uh, you do not have contracts with country code top-level domains, except in some cases. Uh, uh, a, a big CCTLD in Europe uh, always used to say that they may be in agreement with ICANN, but they do not have an agreement with ICANN. Um, within contracts, you can, have, you can easily have a contract with a US-based entity or any entity, 
and the contract specifies that uh, conflicts within that contract, conflicts arising from the contract, will be solved according to non-necessary U.S. law, but according to another country's law. That happens all the time in international private or public contracts. I'm saying this because at the end of the day, our view as the European Commission uh, is that while this is an issue that should not be taken off the table, because that would, uh, that would be myopic, frankly, that issue exists uh, and uh, it has to be addressed rationally, uh, as rationally as possible, uh, but we do not see, at least for the time being, we do not see it as the primary concern within the discussion about the IANA transition and the accountability, the ICANN accountability discussions. In fact, uh, we think that uh, uh, too much discussion about jurisdiction, which I understand is not currently the case within the various working groups that are working on uh, the IANA transition accountability, but too much discussion on that could detract from the fact that what we need uh, more with more priority is a real effective, uh, cost-effective and efficient uh, redress mechanism, which at the moment does not exist within the ICANN system. And I say that, to be very clear, we at the European Commission, we suffer quite a lot because of that. We were in disagreement, sometimes in deep disagreement with certain decisions by ICANN, and we saw firsthand how many hoops you have to go through in order to actually even, uh, even make your, uh, uh, your concerns uh, uh, addressed properly by ICANN, or probably according to our point of view. But one last point I would like to make, uh, and this is uh, uh, as a person uh, uh, born in Italy, living in Brussels, uh, a European, uh, and having been living in the US now for uh, seven or eight months, and I love it completely. It's a great country, great people, the weather is so-and-so, but okay, it's, uh, <laughs> I, guess, I guess that had to be expected. Uh, uh, it's better today than the, the weather forecast <laughs> had said. Um, I wouldn't underestimate the symbolic and cultural uh, importance that people attach to the issue of jurisdiction, because it has to do very intimately with what you as a governmental official, as a citizen, feel uh, you are empowered to do or not. Now, when uh, uh, I, I don't know which country, which government official said what he said about uh, a lower level, lower grade ca um, court in California being able to overturn the Supreme Court uh, mm -hmm. of his country, I can imagine which country it was, but I don't know precisely. <laughs> but you know, that is a very powerful statement. And we shouldn't ignore that because the, the issue does exist. We grow up uh, thinking that we are based in a particular territory with particular courts uh, and our Supreme Court or the equivalent is the highest possible level of judicial oversight that we have. And when you do have uh, a private sector company based uh, in California, US, that can uh, ignore that decision, uh, even though from a legal point of view that might make per perfect sense, and even, even from a practical point of view that might even be better, but that tends to hit some very deep-rooted uh, concerns of people. And again, this concern should not be swept away. They should not simply be ignored saying, well, pff, you're just stupid, you don't get the internet, you don't get how the internet works. Uh, that is not a sustainable approach to the issue. But again, if you allow me, uh, let me reiterate this point because there have been some misunderstandings. Uh, if the issue, if and when the issue jurisdiction comes up, uh, we in Europe and the European Commission in particular will address it. We do not necessarily see it at the moment as the most urgent uh, problem to deal with, that we have many other problems to deal with in both strands of discussion. Thank you. Um, oh, yes, Teresa, please. Just to, um, to add on to that, I think a as we're looking at the accountability mechanisms, and I think this is sort of coming out of some of the discussions with the internet really being global, um, finding the right checks and balances as far as what those mechanisms are in this changing environment and ensuring that those are um, workable on the, on the global scale, you know, is there an appeals mechanism? How does one handle something? You know, the various points that Larry mentioned. Th the solutions that we're looking towards are important to have as a global area. I think, um, as was noted, the jurisdictional factor is is not not the main topic. The real topic is really looking at how do you have the right accountability mechanisms in place that lend comfort to everybody to enable the transition. Thank uh, you. Yes, sir. Uh, Charles Sun, uh, Commerce Department, and I'm speaking in my personal capacities. So the question is uh, for the whole panel. Well, the uh, internet communities, especially the policy makers, are struggling in terms of uh, debating the future of the internet governance. The rest of the internet, especially from a technical perspective, in innovations and the technology development are marching on. And in order to support the future growth of the internet, the issue of a global adoption of IPv6 is very critical, especially when we're talking about 
the internet of the things. My question for the panel, for each of you, is that uh, what is your organization's current policy and practice in terms of uh, adopting IPv6, if you can? Our organization will use it any time that we can. But, but I do think you overstate the importance of ICANN's remit. ICANN manages the labels we use for websites in the domain name system. The IP addresses are allocated, and those IP addresses are deployed by companies that don't have anything to do with ICANN. So one of the things we have to avoid is assuming that any time you talk about Internet governance or innovation, that it has something to do with ICANN. Because in most cases, it does not. Better to keep ICANN tightly focused on a narrow technical mission and the policies that affect just the narrow technical mission of labeling. And if we do that well, ICANN doesn't become a target for other nations or the United Nations to cover to take over. Thank you. While I do not disagree with Steve uh, in the sense that we should not, in my opinion, inflate the role of ICANN uh, within the broader internet governance or internet policy or internet technology ecosystem, I will uh, perhaps slightly nuance, if I may, uh, Steve's reaction in a sense that, uh, first of all, to answer very practically your question, the European Commission does use IPv6, uh, and we do have a number of programs in support of the adoption of IPv6 throughout our member states, and I will be happy to provide you all the details offline after this panel. But the, wh where I see a link with the current discussions, uh, uh, and it's perhaps a feeble link, but I believe there is a political link, IPv6, just like IPv4, just like any internet technology, the internet itself is so powerful because it's global. If you really come to think about it, the, the sheer possibility that you would have a global agreement or a global technology developing so fast, if you look at any other technological development, uh, is mind-boggling. It, it never happened that you could have such a, such a quick and broad spread of any technology in the world. Now, that required, one could argue that that happened because most of the time people were simply not paying attention. So technology had the time to spread without anybody really wanting to block it because they didn't even realize that that technology was happening. But that changed. And, uh, uh, the internet now works because there is a global agreement that it is in everybody's best interest that the internet remains a global technology. That global agreement uh, depends on a global political understanding that we do not step on each other's toes too much. That's the reality. And allow me to insist again that part of that not stamping on each, other, on each other's toes is also that we arrive uh, at the deadline for the change of the IANA, for the transition of the IANA contract with some clear ideas in mind, because if we do not, uh, then I wouldn't exclude the possibility that not Europe, but some other countries might say, well, this was a ruse from the start. Uh, there was no intention of working globally together on this important development, so thank you very much, but we're going to do it our own way. And the technology is already there. There are some very large countries out there which are already have the techno technological ability to to basically nationally segment the internet, and in some cases they are already doing it. Uh -huh. So I would see I would see the I, I would see the link from this point of view, and that makes it even more important that we get to the deadline with, uh, if possible, a proposal, a concrete proposal, if not at all possible, with a very clear timeline of where we get where we move on from there. We are almost at the uh, at the end of this session, and um, we have time for one more question. If you can, here in the front row, make it very brief, and I'm going to ask the panel to keep your uh, responses brief. And please make it a question and identify yourself and affiliation. Thank you, Roger. Uh, Philip Coro in Virtual Law. Uh, right now, governments with ICANN operate through the Governmental Advisory Committee, the GAG, in just an advisory role. The community has sometimes been frustrated by the way they conduct themselves. Andrea has described some of the frustrations of governments with ICANN. My question is, as we work on this accountability, is there a way w within that process we can better integrate the role of governments uh, so they mesh better with the overall ICANN system to enhance accountability and also to help ICANN defend against the many nations that are out there, which unlike the U.S. and the EU, do not support the multi-stakeholder model, but would prefer a multilateral model of internet governance. Yep. Quick responses, please. Uh, excellent question, Phil. And with respect to the broad accountability group, we are trying to give the government the opportunity to have a vote as one of the many stakeholders, number one. Number two, one of the stress tests we designed says that what if the governments change their rule from consensus to voting? That would mean that we had 60 countries at the Singapore meeting. What if 31 of them voted for a crazy idea would that suddenly become the government's 
bottom line position? We think the answer is no. It ought to be a consensus of governments, full consensus, or the governments have to basically say, take a pass on a vote. Uh, Milton. Yeah, I love this question. Um, the, uh, the, the way to integrate governments into the ICANN process, the policymaking process, is to abolish the GAC and tell the governments to go into the working groups that make policy with the other stakeholders. That's, that's what integration means. What we've done is, is a, a tremendous mistake, is we put the governments alone by themselves in a room where they develop their idea of what policy should be, and then the stakeholders are over here developing their idea of what policy should be, and then we have a conflict and a battle which the board mediates. Uh, it's, it's a dysfunctional system, and the only way to actually solve that is to not have a separate uh, GAC, e either make it a true advisory committee that comments on existing policies developed by stakeholders, or to integrate, the, the get rid of the GAC completely and, and make them active participants in the policy process. Uh, Teresa. So, so just quickly on that, in ICANN's first formation stages, um, the GAC used to meet behind closed doors. Um, now the GAC members are participating quite actively in many of the different dialogues, and it's quite a vibrant uh, discussion. And I would really note that even in the processes surrounding the transition, uh, whether it's the uh, stewardship transition process or the accountability process, the governments have seats and they're actually very actively engaged, um, maybe imposing on their holidays um, as well. So I, I think we've seen a, a, a strong progression over um, the years of, of ICANN's existence, and um, hopefully these dialogues will help that progress even further. Uh, thank you very much, and judging by the movement of the bottles on the table, I think we've overrun our time. Please join me in thanking the panel for, for an excellent discussion.